Greetings, everyone. Uh, thanks for being with us today. This is the 24th live stream concert that we've put together in conjunction with Pop Drone. And I'm very happy to welcome back, who I'm sure is a familiar face by now, my good friend, Dr. Michael Kakoff. Oh, doing, yes. Man? Now, it, we really have to use the doctor title. Oh, absolutely. It's just, it's contra you're contractually obligated to do it. Of course. Um, at this point, everywhere. So. Everywhere, for to everything. To the point where I have to get a name change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Dr. Michael is yes, now Yes, it your... has to be one, yeah. one thing. Yeah. <laughs> one title. Yes. You say the whole thing every yes. time. No, you should be proud. That's, that's phenomenal. That's, that's a great accomplishment. Yeah. And as you know, uh, Michael has, uh, has shared with us uh, some previous concerts. Uh, usually when he's been preparing for recording projects, that recording project is now out. Um, with uh, the list, some transcriptions of your own, uh, some yes. original compositions of list, really, really beautiful stuff. So that album is now out on all it's on band It's on Bandcamp nice. and other places. There's also a physical on-demand copy that you can, it's a CDR, but you can order it if someone really wants a CDR. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah it's great. And it's, it's beautiful. It's the, a beautiful project. It's, it's a great idea to kind of, Invest. I know you've been doing a lot of stuff like this as well. Yeah. You know, investing in your own recording projects. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, especially in times like this where it looks like all future live performances are up in the air anyway. Sure. Uh, you might as well have something that is lasting mm -hmm. and that you have a record of what you did to the best of your ability. Yeah. And recordings are forever. So that's yeah. that's absolutely yes. true. And so and speaking of that you're preparing for another recording project, which is gonna inform some of the music that you're gonna perform for us today. Yes. So you're doing uh, the Scriabin sixth sonata today in addition right. to the Liszt sonata in B minor. So two Titanic yes. works. So you're preparing to record those as well? And I'm preparing to record those and I'm also recording a second album of Liszt. I'm actually negotiating with the record label. Yes. Right now to kind of release that with them. And there's also always, you know, financial issues involved when you get a project like this. Of course. But I think it's, it's going to be worth it. So the second album is actually going to be all list. Mm. It's going to be list sonata, scared to in March, a few transcriptions and a few of the late works. Yeah. And the scrab and six sonata is something just for YouTube. Yeah. Because you, it's nice just to release something that it's not tied yeah. to a specific full length album. So that's that. And of course, the list sonata is a cornerstone of the great piano repertoire yes yeah so it's worth doing that's to say the least definitely so let's let's talk a little bit about uh these pieces i suppose we can start with the list sonata so for those of you that don't know franz Liszt is a tremendous piano piano player one of the greatest pianists of all time i can say that pretty authoritatively i mean i've i've played a lot of piano in my day and uh and you know playing his music even though i never heard him play i can tell that he was uh, a man for whom perfection was regular, uh, was uh, at yes. least in terms of um, pianistic ability. So what I, what's kind of unusual about him is that he lived a fairly long life for the time. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what was going on in his life when he wrote this piece? At what point did he write it? Because uh, he, he's got sort of, uh, you know, eras in, in his life and his output. Yes. So what do you think about that stuff? So uh, this was written actually after the, uh, during the Weimar years. So after Liszt retired in the 1840s from the concert platform, uh, previously he toured pretty much everywhere, mm -hmm. including Turkey and places where you didn't even have pianos. He had to bring two instruments with him. Wow. So he toured all over the world. And at some point he actually retired and he retired in the Weimar court. Mm -hmm. And around that time, and this is leading up to the Liszt Sonata, um, he began exploring what to do with the sonata form. Mm. Because Beethoven had written 32 sonatas, mm. and composers at the time were wondering, like, how do you extend this? What are you going to do with them? Because you're not going to write a traditional sonata form in the style of Beethoven anymore. That's been done. Mm. And namely Brahms, Liszt, but actually a lot of other romantic composers, Tchaikovsky, Grieg, um, they explored the sonata form. Yeah. And Liszt's innovation was incorporating the sonata form into some kind of one movement structure. And the first example of this happened relatively early on. It's the Transcendental Etude Number 8. 
Wild Jagd. Uh, yes. And if you look yeah. at the first version of that, it's a much clearer example of a sonata form, including a recapitulation. Mm-hmm. Which so was that, that was a young and, list at that was, point. It was 1830s. Yeah. Um, the other pieces leading up to this, when he's exploring stuff like that, is the Gross Concert Solo. Okay. It's a single movement piece, again, in sonata form. Uh, the concerto, number one, especially. Oh, yeah. It's a little bit different because he uses the same themes, but it's like four movements in one. Yeah. So with the sonata, what you have to understand is it's still a large-scale sonata form. So you have, um, you know, the, you have the exposition, development, and recapitulation. At the same time, you also have distinct movements. Yes. So multiple movements within one. Mm. So I think what might help if you look up kind of the what Liszt did in terms of the symphonic poems. Yes. Because they're related to how he treats the sonata form and what he did with it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's fascinating. So um, for those of you listening uh, that that might not exactly know what a sonata is. So a sonata is a it's a piece of music that has multiple movements or multiple parts. Um, but these parts are meant to sort of go together in a way. And then the parts, these individual parts, have forms or sort of structures of, and of repeats and key signatures and generally how they work. And so composers, so Mozart, Beethoven, as you mentioned, Haydn, of course, uh, they were writing numerous sonatas using these forms, these, these multiple pieces put together, each of which are in these forms. And Beethoven, I think, perhaps probably pushed the, you know, of those three people I mentioned, probably pushed the form the furthest, I would think, in his career. Yes. So by the time Liszt is coming along, like you said, the, the sonata form has already been stretched quite a bit. Uh, and so, you know, I would imagine composers at that point were kind of thinking, well, what more can I add to this yes. uh, after, after Beethoven, after Mozart, after Haydn? Haydn, by the way, was very underrated in, as, a, as a composer of sonatas. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think Liszt definitely, he, he took it in a direction that in, in some ways had never really been done before. But that's kind of cool. I never really thought about this idea that you brought up that he had several attempts at this. Oh, you know, well, I mean, the Dante sonata, of course, is what people well, think of, sure. but I didn't think of the first concerto God, and then the these other things. Scherzo in March is another one. Wow. It's kind of a hybrid thing, but it has elements of a sonata form. Yeah. Um, pretty much a lot of his symphonic poems mm-hmm. that he began writing in the 18, late 1840s yeah. are also in a kind of hybrid single movement sonata form slash um, symphonic poem form, whatever that means. So it was kind of malleable. Yeah. So Liszt is born in 1811, right? Yes. Okay. So when when does this sonata in B minor, the one that you're playing, when does that come along? This is 1853. Okay. But he was working on it for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. At least he was thinking about the idea mm. of a large scale, um, a large scale piece like this. Yeah. And you know, I, I also remember, um, you know, thinking about some things. How this, even the key of B minor, is something that's kind of underrepresented in piano sonata writing, at least up until that point. So, well, I mean, we, you, have you have the Chopin. Right. We have the Liszt Ballade in B minor. Okay. Um, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon, this thing of key neglect, of um, why, uh, I mean, obviously, of course, you could argue that there's physical reasons why for certain sure. keys. For uh, sure. It's, it's a very uncomfortable key. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the primary reason. I think so and as well. And if you look at piano-centered composers, actually the more, um, the more you get into the black keys, the, generally the more comfortable it gets. Sure. Completely, or even something in C major, yeah. completely white keys is more, um, is more pianistic because you have all sorts of effects available to you that way, even glissando and stuff mm. like that. Yes. And uh, pieces with, I'm thinking of pieces like an F-sharp major, right? Chopin Barcarolle, sure. Liszt Benediction, yeah. Scrab and Fourth Sonata. They, they're they very comfortable yeah. in terms of keyboard topography. Yeah, that, that, makes a, that makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, one thing that I've, I've thought is pretty cool about this, uh, this B minor sonata is something that you kind of touched on is how it's, in some ways, it's a sonata within a sonata. So I've, I've seen these... Um, it, it's almost as if it's kind of like a, a fractal or something. Like you zoom in on it and you just get another copy of yes. the original thing. 
uh, which is kind of cool. I mean, did, do you find elements of that in this B minor sonata? Because I think it's I've heard just, a couple. It's, I, would, I would say it's just a really extended mm. sonata form. So he yeah. used the main kind of pillars as a blueprint. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the key areas, yeah, it's, you can see some of these things yeah. in terms of some of the key relationships because the, the main B minor theme, B minor, you have a transition, you have a second theme in D major, mm -hmm. then you get another theme again in D major. Yeah. And in the recapitulation, you get all those three themes in B minor mm -hmm. slash B major and yeah. also as well. Yeah. It's also in B major. So yeah, if you look at the long term. The long, yeah. the macrocosm. Yes, level. but there's a yeah. lot of anomalies as well. Mm. Like a false recap. You expect it because you have the first time you hear, for example, this theme. Very clearly, that's a G. Mm. Well, in the false recap, you get it. You get a half tone, yeah. a half tone lower. I see what you mean. Yeah, the, the yeah. false recap. You know, you see this also in the Scrap and Sonata Number Six. Wow! Because it starts out like this. You know, whatever that key area is, it doesn't really matter. You kind of hear that note on top, and in the false recap, you get everything transposed down hmm. a whole tone. So, so yeah, so let, yeah. let's talk about this uh, the sixth sonata of Scriabin. So Scriabin has, what, 10 sonatas, right? 10 sonatas. 10 sonatas and, and a, a number of other large solo piano works. And Scriabin is, um, he's a kind of guy where it, it's almost as if the the music towards the end of his life and the music at the beginning of his life if you would, if you didn't know anything, it would sound almost like two different, two different people, different composers, two different yes. composers, you know. Yes. Uh, so he's a guy that changes pretty drastically from the beginning of his career to the end. So where where does this sixth sonata fall in terms of his activity and and what he was doing and stuff like that? Yes. Well, around 1905, uh, Scraben became really interested in in mysticism. Okay. And he was reading a lot of theosophical texts and things like that. And, you know, the main ideas that he extracted from this was he consciously set out to create a new kind of tonal system. Mm. And he talked about this in his, um, in his notebooks. So a tonal system based on these beliefs. On these beliefs. And wow. one, of the, one of the main ideas that he took away from all those texts was unity out of multiplicity. Hmm. So in the harmonic system, basically, one of his main innovations of the late works is that melody and harmony became blurred. Hmm. And you end up just having a collection of notes that are now used to create harmonies. Like, for example, you, you take something that's really based on the overtone series. So something like the acoustic scale, let's say from C, it's going to be... You know, acoustic scale is Lydian and Mixolydian, basically yeah. sharp four, flat seven. Mm. You take that, and that was really his main method of pitch organization. However, wow. he would also incorporate sort of octatonic elements. So it's literally the same scale, but with some octatonic notes. So it, uh, most of those notes are the same, but you add in. Yes. So it, using that, as a principle, you can start building chords like, you know, yes. and, you know, you know and chords by fourths, but not necessarily organized in fourths. It's, it's not a prerequisite, but mostly using a something that's a horizontal, horizontal structure, yeah. like a scale or a mode and using that vertically. Yes. That's really what I, and I think it connects, you can make the argument that it connects to unity out of multiplicity. Multiplicity, yeah. Now, the beautiful thing about it is that unlike other composers of the era who explored this, mm. Scraben, Scraben's tonal system has an element of asymmetry. So it's the, the acoustic scale is not symmetrical, therefore it can be transposed mm. in 12 separate areas. Yeah. Therefore, you can establish traditional tonal centers within mm. that. So yeah, people ask, is Scraben's music tonal or atonal? Well, it depends, yeah. because you have a tonal center, Yes. 
but it's not diatonic. Yes, that makes sense. It's not. It's not. It's not relying on a on a major or minor scale. Yes. For the in the late period, at least. Yes. Yes. You know, there's. Funnily enough, I've um, I've played a good bit of Scriabin, but mostly early Scriabin. Okay. So like the first three sonatas and like the fantasy and things. Those like are that. brutal. Yeah, they Those are. Those are extremely yeah, the the early stuff. I've played the eight, uh, twelve etches opus eight. Yeah. It's some of the hardest piano writing there is. Yeah, it's it's bananas. Yes. It's bananas. Yeah. But I've I have noticed, even within those early works some of those things that you've now mentioned, I've actually sort of noticed them floating around. Yes. But the, in disguise. Yes. Like in, in the sense that I, I totally agree with what you're saying, that the, this stuff sort of comes out in the late period. But he's, you, uh, you could see his mind sort of churning, you know, even as early as the, the second sonata, the, the G-sharp minor, which is kind of, mm-hmm. I think, the earliest one that most people play or yes. listen to. I, I noticed as I was learning it some extended areas where he would be operating with uh, with a, a set of pitches only uh, yes. for you know so for example the the entire closing theme of the the first movement of Scriabin is totally diatonic there's no there's no chromaticism at all uh, like the the key signatures in five sharps and he uses only those seven notes for a very long time, which is something that's v- exceedingly rare. Like the, the only other time I can think of it happening is this, uh, this C major slash A minor mazurka of Chopin, uh, where the, the opening section is entirely white keys. It's only white keys. Yeah. And um, that's, that's a really cool idea. This, this idea of taking you know, only seven pitches or 10 pitches or nine pitches and seeing how much music you can make. Again, like you said, not centered around a diatonic scale, but still definitely it has a tonal center in the sense yes. that you can, you can only use... Restricted these, amount of notes. Exactly. Specific, notes, specific yes. elements within yeah. what you're doing. So that's, that's really cool to hear that by the time he's writing the sixth sonata, uh, these ideas have now become... You that's know, right. That's, that's the wonderful part. He didn't discount anything he did previously. Yeah. He simply developed on it. You yeah. could also see a lot of rhythmical elements that became central to his late period works. But you could see early on uh, figurations in five, mm. so not symmetrical, so quintuplets, yeah. Yeah. You know, things like that, yeah. and dotted rhythms, sure. like various kinds of dotted rhythms and cross rhythms. Yeah. No, th- so, I'm actually yeah. glad you're bringing up this point of rhythm. Uh, I know that you've, uh, you've done a lot of study of Scriabin, so this is, uh, you're the, the best person to ask. I've talked to a few different people about this and I've gotten just sort of a lot of opinions on both sides. But one of the things that happens when you look at Scriabin's music, like you've said, rhythmically, it's extremely precise, but it's also heavily asymmetric. Like you'll, there's lots of things where you'll have like five against threes, five against fours, fours against you know seven, six against five. I've seen all of that stuff happening. Um, you know, eight against three, things like that. The, what I've always wondered, and I'm curious to pick your brain about it, is how literal do you believe he believed that stuff was? Do, do you think that he was really thinking about this with surgical mathematical precision, like really five against four, seven against four, six against five? Or was it more just meant to be like, you know, this is sort of an improvisatory thing that I'm approximating with these... Well, these rhythms. Th- that's the interesting thing. A lot of Scraven's music is notated extremely, extremely precisely. Very. So yeah, there is an element of something that has to look really precise and neat on paper. Mm. And you know, it, it goes back to a kind of a long Russian tradition. For example, some of the composers like Balakirev, mm. when they would modulate. One of my favorite composers. They, you know, by there's the way. a spot. <laughs> in the, there's a spot in the Balakirev Islamay, okay. which is notated. And it's it sounds like B minor, yeah. but he notates it as C flat minor. Amazing. So it's like uh, it, there's there's a certain <laughs> visual. Yeah, actually, by the way, funny story. I was learning this many years ago. Yeah. I was doing so well. I was going through it. it this, I was stressed at the time. You're gonna laugh. So mm-hmm. I was going through, it, and then when it came to that spot, I saw it C flat minor, and I was like, I was, you know, I I tore up the music. 
<laughs> I actually, I couldn't help myself. I tore up the music and I said, screw it. I'm not going to do it. Many months later, I came back to it and I learned the piece and it was fine. I memorized. I, I, I didn't give up. Yeah. But just seeing that, yeah, I, ju I just couldn't. I, I couldn't. I broke down. Yeah. I broke down. No, I, I understand. And, and, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, I've for, I'll give you an, exa an example of something similar. If you take a look at the, the C major prelude of Scriabin, I was teaching a class about it. Opus um, 11. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this sort of famous prelude. It's full of all sorts of mathematical inaccuracies, like purposeful, I, I can tell, in, in the sense that there, it's very difficult to tell if certain eighth notes are quintuplet eighth notes or if they are eighth notes. Okay. This, yes. this 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 is something I gotta, that I gotta look that one up on my phone. Yeah, let, like, me, let, me, let me grab my phone. I want yeah, to look do it. it. Yeah, yes, it's. I played it. Yeah. It's been ages and ages and ages. Yeah. We're, we're kind of breaking down into a full on discussion, but it's nice. It is, you know, and. Yeah, like C major, so opus eleven number one. And by the way, if someone's watching this, bring it up on your on your computer on IMSLP. Let's take a look. Yeah. Let's take a look. You know, if you if you take a look at that stuff, you'll see that there's some strange. You know, I, it's not inaccurate. I should I shouldn't say that. But what I should say is that it is ambiguous uh, in in the sense that it is subject to different methods of interpretation. In terms of how you would actually execute. In those terms rhythms. of how you would yes. actually execute it. So, and I'll give you an example. So these, for example, the tempo that he gives you. Uh, he'll say quarter note equals whatever the tempo that he gives you. It's like, sure, but is that quarter note in reference to the real quarter note? Or is that quarter note in reference to two of these quintuplet eighth notes? Let me see this. Very difficult to, to ascertain. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you take, and you know, my point is that whatever method you choose to use to interpret what he's notated, it'll come out beautifully. Like, I'm not saying that you know, he didn't do a good job writing it. I think the fact that his piece is able to be interpreted multiple ways and come out beautifully is, you know, that's a testament well, to his Well, even, his even in terms of phrasing, right? Yeah. So I think that's like one unit. Sure. You know, and I think... No matter how it's notated, that's right. It kind of sounds like something. That's sure. Just, and so if I, you look at yeah. the uh, the left hand there, yes. uh, I mean, I'm sorry, you guys. I know yes. we're we're delving into we're uh, going nuts, uh, here. but it's fine, you know. But if you look at the left hand, you know, you'll see that there's these these quarter notes here, right? Yes. The, and these quarter notes are against these quintuplets. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, what, what? So is this truly a five against three? Yes. Right. Absolutely. Or the thing, but if you mathematically count what's going on in this bar here, you've got one, two, three, four, five eighth notes, and you've got three quarter notes here. I think I think that doesn't matter, and you've seen we've seen stuff like this in List as well. Sure. Where mathematically, it doesn't make any doesn't sense, and, and List yeah. would actually write in remarks that yes, keep the notation deliberately. I kept the notation here deliberately incorrect. Yeah. Trying to think where that happens in which list work. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, it we've happens. seen stuff that mathematically yeah. should not should not lie. Shouldn't up. exist. Yeah. And that's what's so fascinating to me is that for, for Scriabin, someone who is so meticulous about these specificities of mathematical notation, that he for all of that, you know, sort of retentiveness that he has about doing it that way. He's also sometimes very ambiguous <laughs> within, yes. within within that. Yes. So and it's kind of like you know what are we supposed to do here? My opinion is that the notation he wanted to use the simplest notation possible. Fair I enough. I think that's what it really comes down to. I think that makes sense. And yeah, I still can't remember where in which list work I've seen that, but there's a note that List writes to one of his editors, and he said that yes, keep the notation. Deliberately incorrect yeah, okay. in terms of note values. Fair Otherwise, enough. Otherwise, it's going to be impossible to read. Yeah, that's so, fair enough. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I think that's kind of the, the spirit of what music is, like just conveying information. And however you can convey that information in the clearest, simplest way, then, you know, just do it that way. So that, but that's, that's nice to sort of pick your brain about these things. Just my opinion. It's yeah. not the, 
it's not necessarily correct. Yeah. Just my opinion. Yeah, mine, mine as well. So anyway, uh, when is uh, when are you going to be recording these two things? When can we look forward to uh, to hearing them officially? You know, after hearing them here. Well, the the old list album that I'm going to do is actually a later project. It's going to be sometime late October. Yeah. Maybe early November. Beautiful. And this list sonata and the Scrab and Six, which are probably going to go straight to YouTube, um, September, early yeah. September. So Wonderful. relatively soon. Yeah. yeah very it's soon. Skillman Audio. It's not an endorsement. Yeah. It's not a pain endorsement. No, they're, they're it's the just best. an endorsement. No, Way yes. is, way is great. the man. They're great. Yeah, that's yes. awesome. Yeah, I, yes. I've seen the, the stuff that uh, that you did last time. It looks absolutely beautiful. So, yes. yeah, huge thanks to Skillman. Props Thank to them you. for uh, for making making such beautiful products. So. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to turn the stage over to you. You're welcome. You're going to start with the Scriabin, right? I'm going to start with the Scriabin, yeah. yes. So Scriabin 6 Sonata first, immediately followed by the List Sonata in B minor. Yes. And thanks again to Mr. Kakoff. And we're going to finagle some stuff and get started. Or just give us a second.
so yeah, that was the that was the scrap of sonata number six. Um, next up is the Liszt sonata in B minor. Thank you. 
And a huge thanks uh, to Jeremy for having me. You know, you. people kind of underestimate the fact that, you know, a classical musician, or actually any musician, needs some kind of informal setting or something that's a little bit less high stakes. I mean, it's, um, although it is a live stream. Yeah. But you need something a little bit more relaxed because you can't expect yourself to kind of get used to being in the pressure of a recording studio or or a concert hall, especially a recording studio, where as you're going along, you're wondering about two things. Can I use this take? And number yeah. two, if I can't use this take, is my, when is, does my credit card get maxed out? <laughs> right. Because I would, I would like to, you know, because of no, course. no, but it's even if you have an unlimited budget, you want to be reasonable. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, recording is very stressful, um, and it's, uh, it's very psychologically demanding. You know, so I'm, I'm super happy that we're able to have a setting like this uh, where it's, it's live, it's a performance, but it's also relaxed and informal so you can sort of, uh, you know, get your bearings. I think that for a performer, there's really kind of nothing better that you can ask for. That's right. So that's why we're hugely thankful to Pop Drone. We're also hugely thankful to all of our Patreon supporters, uh, to Miss Jean Shimataki, Mr. Alan Soberglate, uh, Miss Irene Drivis. Uh, you guys are really, uh, really, really generous. Miss Rachel Odo, Jonathan Thomas. Uh, thanks so much for your continued support. You're helping to make stuff like this possible and uh, provide a platform for, uh, you know, fantastic musicians such as Dr. Kakoff. So that was the Scriabin 6 Sonata, the Liszt Sonata in B minor. Uh, as always, I encourage you guys to check this out in the archive, which is available for free on Patreon and also on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can see it in crispy 4K goodness. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah that's... Uh, <laughs> well, that's... up until... You have to be careful, because what, what if next year 4K becomes obsolete? Oh, yeah, that's People right. People are already yeah. shooting in 8K, right. 12K. <laughs> IMAX, I mean... right, right. Of course, of course. So, you know, you got to watch it as soon as possible while yes, it's still relevant. before it goes out. Right, right. <laughs> yes. So a huge thanks to all of, our, all of our sponsors. A huge thanks to Mr. Gregory Clark and to Pop Drone, as always. And we will be back with a 25th concert uh, very, very soon. I've got something in the works. And, um, you know, it should be pretty awesome. So thanks yeah, so much. Huge thanks to Jeremy for yeah, organizing this. He organized this whole series yeah, uh, a year ago. Yeah. When was your first, when was your very first? I want to say it was a, a little bit over a year ago. Yeah, it was right in the, the heat of the pandemic when we first started doing this. And, um, you know, I'd, at the time when I started, I had no idea that we'd still be streaming and doing this. But... Um, the yes. people, people are still giving, uh, people still want to hear it, people still want to play, so I'm happy yes. to keep doing it. I enjoy this. Like I said, I've got the best seat in the house. Yes. I just get to talk to uh, you know, genius-level intellects and then sit back and let them take over. So I, you know, I Unfortunately, genius-level <laughs> is a term that keeps getting... The, the, plane, the, you know, the plank for that keeps getting lower and lower, <laughs> and at some point, it's going to be used as an insult. <laughs> Oh man! Well, fortunately, you're one of those guys that's helping to keep the standards high. So you know, we All right. we we do the best we can. So, thanks so much again for checking us out, and we'll see you thanks next time. Thanks a lot time. for watching. Thank yeah. you. Yes, stay safe. Definitely, stay healthy too. Yes. All right. Likewise. Take care. Take care.